We have lived in this house for almost eight years now, and there are lots of things to share. Our neighborhood sits on the original town cemetery from the 1800s. In the 70s, when they built the neighborhood, they only removed the graves they needed to put in the foundation and the sewage system. We didn't know this until we had been living here for three to four years. But when we found out, it certainly explained a lot. While we were still in the process of moving in and hadn't even spent the first night in the house, I heard two little kids talking. I heard it clear as day. A girl probably of around 10 or 12 and a little boy who sounded no older than five. I only have two brothers, both younger than me, but still older than either of those kids. It sounded like any younger siblings playing. And because it sounded so normal, I can't remember exactly what was said. Obviously, the first thing I did was call out to them, and then the playing stopped. I never heard them leave. I searched the house and no one was inside. Everyone was in the backyard putting together our swing set. I told my mum what I heard, and she of course didn't believe me. I dropped it, and we moved on. Months later in my room, I'm trying to sleep, when I roll over and see the reflection of a girl in my TV screen. I realized I was seeing her back, long curly blonde hair, and a blue dress that appeared to be from the 1800s. Somehow in my sleep deprived brain, I thought it was my own life size doll and ignored it and went back to sleep. It definitely wasn't. It was the wrong color and the doll was facing the TV. So there's no way it was her. I didn't tell my mom this time round because she didn't believe me the last time. After that, stuff started moving around. Things fall off the stairs that are carpet. And the lights around the house turn on and off at random. I hear people walking around the house all the time. And still my mother does not believe me. Which is really stupid because she believes in ghosts. I affectionately named the ghost girl Lizzie because it just felt right. Finally, one day I'm out with my friends doing teenage stuff. It's roughly 11 p.m. at night, and all of a sudden, my mum calls me. Tell Lizzie not to scare the crap out of me. Turns out, she'd gotten up to use the bathroom, and when she returned to go back to bed, she'd seen a dark orb hovering over her side of the bed. When she saw it, it quickly exited via the ceiling, and then she called me. Not long after that, we found the local news articles about our neighborhood and the cemetery. We also found out that during a flood one year, one particular casket kept popping back up and it had to be moved. And that a lot of the neighborhood still have headstones visible in their yard. We're horrified because we definitely noticed some weirdly flat stones out near our garden and one only five or six feet from fruit trees that we planted. So now we all accept that we live with a ghost or two Weird stuff happens all the time. They stop throwing stuff off the stairs, but they now show up in our Xbox Connect, turn sinks on, and occasionally knock stuff over. But I also sometimes will hear them talking faintly. I haven't seen either of them since the first time, but I know they're still about. We treat them like family, talk to them, offer them snacks, leave toys out to play with. Life is weird, and new people in the house never take long to notice. Lately, I've also been seeing a shadow cat hanging around. We have two cats already, but neither of them can disappear through walls. So there's that. Another story I have to share is one day my friends and I were leaving the house. I don't remember where we were going, and my mum comes around the corner swearing she saw someone walking down the hallway. We were all in the living room, and my brothers weren't home. At the time, we had our Xbox set up on a dresser, with its own TV so the kids could play games without taking over the living room, and said dresser was right next to the doorway that leads into the hall. My mom says she thinks she heard the Xbox turn on, and comments on how easy it would be probably for the ghost to turn it on since the button is so sensitive. We all have a chuckle at the ghosts playing video games and continue to the door. Not 10 minutes later, 
my mum caused me to tell me that the Xbox had in fact been turning on and off repeatedly, that she was trying to watch TV and it started to freak her out. I laugh because of course Lizzie would do that. You just told her how it works, I say, and I hear my mum politely ask her to stop because it's distracting and the beeping from the console stops for maybe a minute or two before it starts again. My mum makes me come back early, supposedly because Lizzie likes me and she'll stop if I ask her. The Xbox continued to turn on and off at random, albeit every once in a while now for the next few weeks. Now when our consoles or even the TV turn on by itself, we'll ask her what she wants to watch and play, but never get an answer. About six years ago, I was dating a girl who was extremely spiritual. It completely opened my eyes to different aspects of life and death. I always left my cell phone next to the bed in case anyone ever needed me in the middle of the night. No one ever called me past 2 a.m. unless something bad happened. Now I have bad sleep insomnia, sometimes worse than others, but this night I was able to fall asleep at a normal time, roughly 10 p.m., and my significant other was already fast asleep. I had woken up at 3 a.m. on the dot to my cell phone ringing. In a daze of sleep, I quickly pick up the phone, not looking at the number, and I hear an echoing voice that sounded underwater repeating, please help me, get my father, please. Creepy as that is, here's the kicker. It was my significant other's voice on the phone. Now, that caught my attention and woke me right up. I'm in bed, looking down at her and hearing this thing. Please get my father, I need help. Take a step back. Hearing this thing on the phone made my stomach drop. It's like I knew she was passing away. It completely freaked me out. I moved my leg and realized that there's a body next to me, and obviously it's her, and I start violently shaking her asking if she's here next to me. The person or this thing on the phone is still begging me for help, and I'm shaking my significant other, the one who's right next to me. The plea for help for her father, once again, is drowned by the water sound and the echoed voice. At this point, her eyes open wide and she realizes it's her own voice and we both look at the number. It's just a bunch of ones. And I say her name over the phone asking, how can I help? And we both watch whatever it is, hang up the phone and disconnect. The number was untraceable by the phone company and didn't even show up in the records of my cell. This is one of the creepiest things that's happened in my life. I'm looking up similar things I can find, but she was very much alive and next to me. Could this have been a call from another dimension? We, to this day, have zero explanation, and I can never shake the feeling that she was leaving this world from the other side of the phone, passing on, begging me for help. My most recent paranormal experience happened in August of 2019. To preface, my older cousin Charlie had passed away in late July, and his death hit my family pretty hard. It was very unexpected. And within a week of finding out, we had to drive nine hours to North Carolina for the wake and funeral, stay two nights and then drive nine more hours back home. It was truly one of the hardest things I've ever had to go through. Earlier in the year, the rest of my family had planned a trip to Portugal that very same week that we ended up having to go to our cousin's funeral. Since the trip had been planned so in advance and the death was so sudden, they were unable to cancel the trip. So a few days after the 18 hour round trip to North Carolina, my family packed up to go to Portugal and visit our grandmother. I, however, was not going on the trip with them. I had to stay home and take care of our cat. He has this medical condition that we have to keep up with him every day, and we didn't want to have to ask another family member to watch him for 10 days while we were gone. So I ended up staying with him home alone in our five bedroom, three story house for about a week and a half with my cat. 
With everything that happened within those two weeks prior to my family leaving, I was not in a great headspace. So I was quote unquote, self medicating with the green stuff. My parents don't really know that I'm a stoner. So with my entire family being gone, I was able to smoke freely in my backyard for most of the days and relax with my cat. One night I was sitting in bed and decided to smoke a little bit in my bedroom before I went to sleep which I never really did in the house. Since my family was still going to be gone for a few days, I figured the smell would have dissipated by the time they got home. I smoked a small bowl and just went to bed as normal. A little before 5am I was awoken to a loud banging in my room. My eyes shot open. And I looked around the room but saw nothing. Thoughts were racing through my head. What was in my room? Was it somewhere else in the house? Maybe it was my cat that knocked something over in the hallway? Or was it another animal? We've had some squirrels in the attic recently. But wouldn't I also hear little animal feet scratching? I heard nothing. My room was silent. My heart was absolutely pounding and after maybe 45 minutes of wanting to either see or hear something else exhaustion hit me and I fell back asleep until the morning. When I woke up the next morning, I look around my room to see if I could find the source of the sound. I find on my floor a heavy hardwood cover book that had been displayed on my bookshelf that had fallen off the shelf, which was at least six feet above the ground. In my 20 years of living in that house, I've never had anything so concrete and unexplainable happen to me. The book had been placed standing up on its side with at least three inches from the edge of the shelf. I had had it sitting there for at least three years and it hadn't moved at all. The shelf was perfectly level and was not any slant forward. There also wasn't any opening that I could visibly see where an animal could have gotten in. In the days prior to this happening, I hadn't even gone over the area of my room or moved things around. I showed my dad who was a complete skeptic what happened after my family got home from the trip. And he really couldn't explain it. The words, maybe it was a ghost even escaped his mouth. The rest of my family is not and never have been interested in the paranormal. I'm sort of the odd one out. Growing up in that regard, I did have an imaginary friend, the name of which happened to be the previous homeowner of the house who had passed away. I had a very minor paranormal experience while in middle school, seeing some orbs in my bedroom, and just the general feeling of being watched. The feelings sort of went away as I got older. But my sister who would sometimes stay in my room while I was away at college would tell me it felt like there were eyes on her when she would sleep. I guess I just got used to it as I got older. Two years ago, Two friends and I decided to go on a late night adventure and drive to a bigger city about an hour away from our hometown. We got to the city around 11pm and were just exploring random areas there. I had my iPhone plugged into the car playing music and out of nowhere the music cut out and the screen changed to maps. A destination was entered in the map and a male AI voice began telling us where to go. We decided to follow it like it wasn't something straight out of a horror movie. The first destination it took us was a worn out road at the back end of a construction site. The road went up to a forest that was surrounded by large fences. There were no trespassing signs everywhere. So we decided to turn around. The GPS then rerouted us to another point about 20 minutes away from the first. We drove to the second point and it was a dead end road on the opposite side of the forest from the first road. We were pretty freaked out by the experience and reconnected my phone and went back home. Fast forward a few days ago. One of my friends who I had gone with was talking to me on the phone. He brought up the experience and we decided to look into it. We found the two roads on Google Earth and could see a house in the forest with a clearing behind it. We started doing some research on the house and came across a court document connected to the address. 
Developers had bought the land and were denied approval to build on the land where the house stood. I didn't think much of it until I read further and saw why they were denied. The clearing we saw on Google Earth ended up being a cemetery where the original settlers of the city were buried. With more research, we came to find that a man who had owned the land sometime before the 90s had moved every headstone leaving the graves unmarked. It took historians years to discover the cemetery, and they were granted permission to make a thorough report on it. They found 99 grave shafts, but 60 of them were much smaller, meaning they belonged to children. The developers had unveiled in court that they simply moved the remains into a corner of the new subdivision without any cemetery. The other road that we were brought to was on the other side of the forest as if it wanted us to drive from one side to the other when we didn't make the main road. The weirdest part about this whole experience was when we noticed the court date was exactly 10 years ago from the date we did the research. We found it odd that it took us so long to look into what the GPS could have been taking us to, and that out of every day it happened, it happened on the 10 year anniversary. It's pretty crazy. I honestly believe that our GPS was being manipulated by a spirit that belonged to the graveyard and they wanted to let us know what had happened there. If you care to do your research, it's called Lime Kiln Road, Ancaster. The road into the forest, Bailey Road, Ancaster. Second Dead End Road, Cooley Hat Pioneer Cemetery. When I was around eight, my 32 year old aunt found out that her cancer had returned and was diagnosed with metastatic breast cancer that had spread to her stomach, lungs, and spine. At the time, I wasn't familiar with cancer, just knew that it was a bad disease. My family told us she had cancer, but did not elaborate any further. The day she received her diagnosis, all of the adults, my gammy, my papa, five aunts and uncles and my mum, dropped myself and about five or six of my cousins off at another relative's house to keep an eye on us. We were all young, not knowing what was really going on but we all felt like something big was going to happen. I've always been an anxious and extremely empathetic person. For a while, I could guess what people were thinking. I knew stuff that there was no way I could know. The adults returned and were visibly upset. They told us it's not good, but that we were going to fight it and the doctors are going to try everything they can. Fast forward a few months, me and my cousin are sleeping over at my aunt's, and she got me alone and asks me something along the lines of, how much longer do you think I have? When do you think I'm gonna die? She had a son that was around three at the time, and in my gut I knew she didn't have long. I thought I would be nice and give her hope. So I tell her, when Mac is about seven, she immediately bursts into tears and screams, Thanks a lot. That really disturbed me and kind of broke something in me. I didn't know what to do or say. I thought I was being good and giving her time. After that, I tiptoed around her and didn't really engage with her anymore. She ended up passing four months later. My cousin and I slept over at my Grammy's and slept in her room with the light on before my aunt's burial. The morning of, I'm waking up, but don't actually want to get out of bed yet. So I'm just laying on the little bed that's set perpendicularly at the foot of Gammy's, with my cousin wiping my eye boogers away, trying to move too much so that I don't wake my cousin and annoy her. My eyes are closed, but I'm definitely awake. I start to blink, my eyes clear of them, and I can see my now deceased aunt walk into the room She's wearing the bright red outfit with a little Christmas teddy bear jingle necklace that one of the kids gave her that we were going to bury her in. I can hear it make a jingle, but muffled because it's up against her clothes, almost like she was trying for it to be quiet as possible. I'm squinting at her, and I'm in disbelief. I have no reaction or emotion, I'm just in shock. 
She walks over to Gammy, who's still sleeping, and leans over for a bit, turns around and walks out the room. As she passes by me, I closed my eyes and pretended to be asleep. When she got in the hallway, the jingling got louder and more pronounced, like she didn't care if it did make a noise. I tried telling people about it, but of course no one believed me. Just a little kid trying to be cute, saying she saw her aunt, blah blah blah. My second experience. I was driving with Gammy, her niece and my cousin, out to a property that Gamli's family owned, and her niece starts talking about the witches in the family. Apparently, it's a generational thing, and each generation passes it personally on to the next. Gammy acted like she didn't know anything about it. So I've got witchy blood? My dreams. I've heard from a few people and even read online in dream dictionaries that dreaming of fish means someone's going to be pregnant. I dreamt that a family member or close friend and I are on the beach or on a boat or in a canal. There's a huge fish in the water and initially we're both freaked out, but then the friend or family member will jump in the water with the fish. A few months later, I'd forgotten about the dream and I find out that they're pregnant. I had a dream that my aunt was breastfeeding her son, googled it, and it could mean illness. Turns out she has some rare blood disease, didn't know she was ill. One time in high school, I dreamt that me and one of my friends were going to meet up with someone to buy some weed, but my friend lost her money. The next day I meet up with my friend in my dream and another mutual friend. The mutual friend starts with, last night me and her were going to meet up with, you know, thingy, and I cut her off and tell them about my dream. Get the requisite. That's so weird. A lot of times I'll dream of random scenarios or scenes and a few days later these things will play out. The scariest dreams for me though, if I have premonitions, are the dreams where my daughters and I are in a horrible plane or boat accident and my youngest drowns. Always a plane or on a boat, and it's always my youngest. Q anxiety induced paranoia. Well, my friends, if you've made it this far, I salute you. Thankfully, none of the bad things have happened to my immediate family just yet, unless they're mentioned here. Let's hope my dreams are wrong. My mother used to tell me that when I was very young, I would talk to someone who I would call the lady. When she asked me about this lady, I would describe a kindly middle-aged woman who stood in the doorway between the living room and the kitchen and spoke to me. She never moved from the doorway. Of course, it freaked my parents out a bit, but they always figured that it was just an imaginary friend. But what kind of kid has a middle-aged lady as an imaginary friend who never moves from one spot? I don't remember anything about the lady, though. I do, however, remember a strange incident one night. I was reading comics after bedtime by the light that used to come into the room from the landing when I became aware of someone coming up the stairs. So I did what every kid does and pretended to be asleep so I didn't get in trouble. But I kept a sneaky eye open so that I could return to my comic once the coast was clear. The person approached the top of the steps, paused and then came into my room. I could see it was a man and assumed it was my father checking on me. But rather than come forwards towards the bed, the man started pulling at an old nail up hatch in the ceiling. It gave two or three different pulls from different directions and then left the room. I was absolutely convinced that it had been my father, but not wanting to get in trouble, I didn't mention it for about a week when my curiosity got the better of me. I asked him what he had been doing and why he had been pulling at the hatch. He had never been to my room at night and certainly had no interest in an old and entirely unusual hatch when there was a perfectly operational hatch to the same place in his own room. The last vaguely supernatural experience I ever experienced was many years later. I had been out for a few drinks with my friends, a regular occurrence which always ended up with a longer walk back to town, some three miles into the countryside. I had no torch and mobile phones weren't yet common enough for me to have one. The last half mile was through a wood with an old quarry to one side, which was always a little unsettling, 
as you could hear the screech of tortured metal in the wind, or an unseen animal rustling through the undergrowth. However, there were a pair of white dogs who lived on the other side of the woods, who would always join me as I walked past and they accompanied me through the woods. And I was always grateful for having them with me, especially since they were so easy to see by the moonlight. Once we got there, to the other side of the woods, they would turn back and head home. Then one night they came bounding up to us as usual and walked with me right up until we got to the edge of the woods, at which point they stopped, pricked their ears towards the wood and ran away. Naturally quite a lot of poo came out, but since I had no choice but to go through the woods, I bailed on experiencing the journey as hard as possible by singing at the top of my own voice and moving as quickly as possible until I had cleared the woods and arrived home. But the strange bit was that I never saw those dogs again. My entire life, my grandfather has lived in a large home in a somewhat wooded area in a town outside of Dallas, Texas. We would camp out and explore the area when I was younger, before people decided to start building more in that area. In order to get to the house, you would have to turn off the main road into a cemetery. Not sure why, but the road cuts straight through a pretty large old cemetery. I like to go there on nice days and look around sometimes. It's a good walk from my grandfather's house down a road heavily lined with trees. I've seen gravestones with dates as far back as the early 1800s, and they are always really neat in my opinion. So at this point in time, I'm between homes and staying with my grandfather. It was about 1am and I'm hanging out with a friend from work, telling them about how I like this cemetery. They're interested in going to see the place and want to take some long exposure pictures with a camera that they recently got. So we head that way and I take them to where all the really old graves are. Now I've always been somewhat sensitive to things considering paranormal. I've had a few weird experiences and tend to trust my instincts when I feel something's off. From the time I parked inside the cemetery that night, I probably knew that I shouldn't be there. My instinct was kicking in. But I ignored my gut, because my friend was excited and I really wanted to show them this cemetery and explore the surrounding woods with them. So we walked along the wood line towards the far back corner where the oldest graves are to take some pictures of the headstones and pay our respects to the people who have been there the longest. My friend takes a lot of pictures and I walk around with the flashlight, adding lighting and reading the graves. The entire time I'm feeling like I'm being watched. I shake the feeling and again ignore my instinct because my friend looks like they're wrapping up. They start looking through their images while I make sure we got all our trash and water bottles that we brought with us. A friend calls me over while I'm doing this and asks me to look at one of the photos they just took of some graves and the tree line. I look at the photo, a little bit freaked out, but I realize I probably need to stay calm for my friend's sake. I look up to where the photo was taken and see what the camera saw. What my friend doesn't see is in the tree line is a large black humanoid mass with glowing red eyes. I'm not sure how else to describe it, but it looked and felt like rage personified. In all my life, all the times I've explored the area, I had never seen or felt anything like that. I ask my friend to slowly start walking back to the car. I'm pretty sure they knew something was wrong because I was dead serious and hardcore staring where they just took that creepy photo. I'm backing my way to the car and watch the shadow watch us as we leave. We get to a point where I can see the car, but not the shadow anymore. So I turn around and start power walking towards my car, key in hand. I'm still on the edge, but I'm feeling better that we're getting out of there. All of a sudden, the shadow appears about 20 foot to my right in the tree line. I tell my friend to run the rest of the way to the car, and at this point we are running, 
and are almost to the car when my friend glances behind us and sees this thing for the first time. They freak out, speed to the car and frantically leap into the passenger side. I have just gotten my keys in the ignition when the shadow slams into my friend's door, its face right up against the glass. Imagine having a solid shadow, featureless, and then with two red LEDs where the eyes are. That's about what we saw menacing us on the other side of the glass. I get in the car and started to pull out as fast as I could, without hitting any graves and start to drive the hell out of there. I find the official gate, even though there are plenty of other closer exits to the road, but I've always heard if you enter and leave through the same gate of a cemetery, you leave everything you found there and can't take it with you. I'm telling you now, that's all BS, but that's for another story. We're leaving, when this thing is keeping up with us, all the way to the gate, and it stops. We head to the main road, and to my friend's place, laughing hysterically because the adrenaline was wearing off, and we survived something crazy. I get them home, but I have to go back through the cemetery to get home myself. And thankfully I didn't see the shadow again, but I believe this is because my friend wasn't with me. After that night I had a bunch of more crazy things happen to me in the area while hanging out with them. But I think for now that's enough. I thought we were being respectful. In any case, remember to respect cemeteries everyone. I wasn't there at the time this happened, but my grandfather told me about this, and as far as I know he's never told the lie in his life, so I wasn't too skeptical. That being said, I don't have any evidence except the word of the witness. My grandma tragically passed away from a colon infection about two to three weeks ago at the time of sharing this, June 1st, 2019. It was one of the most depressing times for our family, considering that my grandmother was one off, if not the nicest person in the world. Something kind of weird happened a few days after the funeral though. My oldest uncle has a dog, when my uncle brought the dog over to my grandfather's house, the dog started acting super strange. Literally the first thing the dog did was go straight to my grandmother's old room and start barking at nothing. After my uncle got him out of the room and to stop barking, the dog went over to the chair in the family room my grandmother always used. He hopped onto the chair and hopped off, then proceeded to sit in front of the chair and stare at it. This wouldn't seem too weird at first glance until you realize that is exactly what the dog would do if someone was sitting in a chair he hopped on. No one was in the chair as far as we could see. I swear dogs have a sixth sense for seeing the past, it's incredible. At least we know that my grandma is still around in a way. Back in 2012, when I got out of high school, me and my significant other at the time rented a trailer here in our town. We moved in and got settled, but I knew something was weird about the place from the beginning. The trailer was always so hot, even with the air conditioning on it would still be 90 degrees. The back bedroom was painted this horrible blue colour, but you could still see some sort of stain on the walls under the paint. Think about the square diamonds mirror that are in the trailers. The stains were outlined under the paint. I was working at a Dairy Queen at the time, and was talking about where we had moved to, and just talking about how strange the place was. We live in an extremely rural town, population of maybe 2,000, so everybody knows everybody. A lady I worked with told me that that trailer was the one that Annie was murdered in. Everyone in town remembers the murder. It was over some drugs. She had been homecoming queen turned addict, and it was a big deal. My cousin came and spent the night, and I told him that we had heard about the trailer. He started provoking the spirit and saying, come get me then. At that moment, the electricity starts blinking, and a moving box falls off the table. After that night, everything escalated quickly. The next week, we were laying in bed watching the devil inside and it sounded like someone had a shotgun right next to our head. It scared us both to death. 
So my significant other at the time got up to check the rest of the house and nothing had been touched or went off. We went to his parents for the evening, for dinner and honestly just to get out the house. We came home around midnight and went to bed. He fell asleep, but I lay there. I felt like something was watching me. Our bed was facing the hallway and I could feel something watching me from there. I wasn't having sleep paralysis. I had just laid down. Whatever it was crawled on top of me and I could feel its breath on my neck and it smelled bad. I was trying to wake my significant other. I was crying and couldn't move. I was holding my arms down and finally I got my partner awake and he turned on the light. I never went to sleep that night. Another night we had some friends over for pizza and Halo. I was making the pizza and I had a stack of plates on the counter, getting ready to serve. Then the whole stack of plates completely levitated off the counter. Everyone was completely in shock, but I was used to it by then. We finally ended up moving out about a week after. I have always been interested in the paranormal and going ghost hunting, as me and my friends call it anyway. This story takes place on an October night in 2005, almost 15 years ago now. We had gathered at my dad's house for a party. He lived way out in the country in an old farmhouse. We decided to drive up the road to an old cemetery because one of my friends showed up with a Ouija board. I said we weren't going to use it in my house, but I was game to use it elsewhere. About six of us piled into the vehicles and took off. When we got there, we set the Ouija board up on an old concrete barrier that surrounded the entrance of the cemetery. For context, the cemetery was set on a hill surrounded by cow pastures, fields and trees, and across the road stood a white church. There were two security lights that lit up the church area and the entrance to the cemetery. There was one more security light that lit the field next to the only house for about two miles. We all stood in a circle, planchette in the center and hands on it. My friend led the seance and asked if there was anything in the cemetery with us. At first, nothing happened and we all stood still and quiet. Then the planchette slowly moved towards yes. Immediately, we start accusing each other of moving it, of course. But everyone swore they didn't. An eerie feeling fell over us as the planchette moved back to the center of the board. About that time we heard what sounded like wind at first, but then began to get closer and it sounded like footsteps of multiple people running in circles around us. We were all wide eyed, looking at each other when someone said out loud, I'm out. Another person said, we have to tell it by or the spirit will follow us. The leader of the group spoke to the board and said something along the lines of, we are saying goodbye to you. And the planchette quickly jerked to no. It was pretty obvious by how shocked we all were that none of us had done it. Mind you, the sound of the footsteps are still surrounding us. The planchette moves to the center and we say bye again. And again, it moves to no and back to the center. This time we all say together, goodbye, we're leaving. And it slowly, agonizingly moved to goodbye. We were relieved and took off running to the cars, which were parked by the entrance of the cemetery side of the road. Me and my buddy jump into the truck. Then I hear my friend scream, guys, I can't find my keys. She checks the ignition, her pockets, and all our friends check their cars and their pockets to no avail. Everyone else here loads back into the truck and we speed the three miles down the road to my dad's house. My friend searches her pockets, her purse and everywhere, but couldn't find them anywhere. Eventually someone takes her home and she says she'll get her spare and get a ride back to her car in the morning. We were all too scared to go back and look for them that night. The next day, my friend searches the cemetery and never finds the keys, even in broad daylight. We haven't walked around the whole lot and where we used the cemetery was very close to where we parked, which didn't leave much room for things to get lost. 
Me and several friends scoured the entire cemetery over the course of the next week, but never found the keys. My friend said she was 100% positive they were left in the ignition when she got out the car. It's where I left mine, and a common practice in the area, where I'm from. Which, like I said, is pretty rural. This was by far the scariest, but not the only Ouija experience I've had. I have had countless paranormal experiences during my life. All of my immediate family, that is blood related to me, have a bit of a paranormal edge. Like, we're nothing amazing that people will be wowed by, but we can all do something a smidge out of the ordinary. My mother has what I call death now dreams. She dreams of people when they're about to pass away, maybe a few hours before. And if she's within physical distance, she tries to go to them so that they don't pass alone. My older sister gets precognitive messages via radio, which funnily enough is a sign of schizophrenia, but she's never been wrong, so we've never been worried. My older brother can see spirits, I'm really anything non-physical. We come from a background where this ability is almost expected of him, so we don't pay it much mind. Then there's me, a mishmash of weirdness. Sometimes I can see things, sometimes I hear things, and sometimes I just know there's something there. I've always been able to do it, but it's pretty inconsistent, and I usually chalk it up to the fact I don't necessarily want to notice these things. So one of the most memorable experiences I've had, and the one that leads me to my question. When I was a freshman in college, my family got a Netflix subscription. I would be staying up late in the living room doing homework and listening to shows in the background, while everyone else is asleep. One of the first shows I binged was Medium. It basically is a show about an Arizona housewife who sees spirits and solves their crimes. The show is pretty average, but it makes her abilities seem really amazing in a nice and mundane sort of way. After binge watching five episodes, I thought, for the first time in my life and without fear, hmm, maybe it wouldn't be so bad seeing the spirits. It might actually be pretty cool. Just that, just a thought in passing. Not five minutes later, I turned from where I was sitting on the couch, thanks to what I can only assume was my sixth sense, and I saw a large glowing light rush down the hallway and vanish through the wall. No, it wasn't even in the corner of my eye. It was the reflection of the light. Because, how even? I wasn't even close to any windows. Because, then it may have been a passing car. It was eight feet in front of me. And traveled in the trajectory in front of my face. I'm a scaredy cat, guys. And when I say I screamed, I take it back. I mean I screamed it loud. And I never backtracked so hard in my life. I've seen a few things since, but nothing so aggressive or blatant as that night. The one factor that I think was different was that I wasn't afraid that night. I was perfectly comfortable and chilled. All my other experiences have been nerve-wracking experiences and they've all been far less alarming. So here's my question. Do you think seeing spirits is a choice? If we just weren't scared and a bit more open, do you think all of us would be able to perceive the paranormal? Or do you think there is a circumstance unique to me and my family? Hope to hear from you guys soon. When I was around two, I had an attachment that I described to my mum as a Native American chief. Obviously, I have no recollection of this. This has been told to me. She told me I used to run from him screaming and crying, and after I was well past her, she could feel a burst of cold air follow. He tormented me day and night until she did some type of cleansing to banish him and placed a white candle in my window to keep him away. For as long as I can remember, she made sure I knew I couldn't move the candle, and it always followed us when we moved. We had a family friend who I referred to as Uncle John, though he had no relation to me. Apparently, I adored the man, and 
he would get me to dance a lot. After he passed, I would still talk to him and do the dance randomly. Around this time, a family member went to the hospital and while in the room, I was looking out of the window and said, Mommy, look at all the angels out there. She said this is probably one of the scariest things I've ever said to her, but she can't really pinpoint why it was so frightening. Most of my childhood was fairly quiet after that, which I gave the candle credit for until my parents divorced and started dating again when I was in middle school. My dad met Margaret, who's a paranormal investigator and specifically could sketch spirits. And I immediately adored her because I've always been interested in scary stuff. But my dad was a huge skeptic. There's a very small, very old cemetery a ways behind my dad's house. So she decided we were going to do a mini investigation there one night. I was in charge of taking pictures while she tried to get EVPs. We couldn't hear or see anything while there, but I told her I could feel something. Without telling me what she was feeling, she asked me questions such as, do you feel they're male or female? Do they seem younger or older? I told her I thought there was a younger boy and his dad, to which she agreed. Soon after this, one of my legs started feeling cold and electrified. What most people describe when feeling touched by a spirit. We went back to check the pictures and recordings and found I had caught a lot of what appeared to be orbs. Most were white, but in some of the pictures we kept seeing, one was red. Upon listening, we heard a child, a man, a woman, and someone who sounded incredibly angry, maybe because we weren't aware of her. Even my dad was a bit taken aback and felt shaken because he couldn't explain it. Soon after, they broke up, and that was the end of my amateur ghost hunting days. A while later, when I was 16 or 17, my mom remarried and we rented a house that was surrounded by forest at least half a mile from the road. The bedrooms were on the opposite ends of the house and each had a private bathroom and mine also had its own porch. Initially, I loved it. My own bathroom and porch? Hell yeah. But soon I realized that I never felt alone. It was worse on the porch or in the bathroom but my closet doors were mirrors and I always felt very afraid of them. The first thing I noticed was that I hated my bathroom window. Even when the candle in it, I always felt like someone was looking at me despite it being forest behind the house. I never looked at it and spent as little time as possible in the bathroom as I could. I felt the same way outside because the behind the porch, the area was forest but I could never shake that feeling that some of the sounds never felt right. Obviously, some of it had to be living creatures in the woods, but some of the things I heard made my gut freak out. I knew it wasn't just an animal somehow. One thing I forgot to mention is that my bedroom had a smaller room attached to it, that I eventually made my bedroom while the original became my personal living room. I just couldn't stand sleeping in front of all those mirrors because the closet took up a whole wall. That room really didn't feel any better though. And I once took a picture that had a screaming face in it. The most chilling incident had to be the ghost creature though. My room attached to the kitchen on one side and the living room attached to the other. I was in the kitchen making food and out of the corner of my eye, I see what I thought was my mum's blue healer go into my room and under my bed, which was weird because he was far too fat to fit under the bed. I turn and walk into the living room only to see both dogs fast asleep on the couch. I stayed far away from the room for a few hours after that. Now I no longer have a candle. I moved so many times in a few years that I lost it and things are mostly normal. There was also one further experience that happened to my mother. Many years ago, my mom worked as an overnight CNA at a nursing home. I've seen this almost exact type of experience spoken of from other nursing homes after she told me. And I think the consistency is amazing. There were three spirits who roamed the halls and they named them the lady in white, the man in black and the priest. The first two descriptions were obvious and the priest was a greyish apparition. 
They knew when the residents were close to passing, when they mentioned one of the three visiting them in their room, or when they saw the apparition enter a room. Additionally, they always died in threes. They all agreed the lady in white was to escort to heaven, the man in black was for hell, and they weren't sure about the third. Now the scariest thing my mum has ever told me is that I truly hope I never experience. She awoke in the middle of the night to a spectre standing above her. She saw his face and knew she was looking at death himself. To this day, she doesn't know why he was there or what he was doing. All that she knows is that she nearly crapped herself. She was quite unsettled and yet calm. I wonder if she was supposed to pass that night, but he had mercy on her. I'm glad he didn't take her and hope he waits a long time before he returns. I have had a number of paranormal experiences happen to me during the course of my life. My first experience was at my own home in Florida about six years ago. We had just moved about roughly a year before and the house was brand spanking new. We were the only residents ever to live here. My dad and his wife both went on a trip to another state and my brother was back with his dad 2000 miles away. I was completely alone in my two story house for two weeks. I've been home alone countless times and the first week was nothing out of the ordinary. But by the second, I was feeling uneasy with my surroundings. And you know that feeling that you get when someone stares at you and you immediately look and there's something locking eyes. That's the feeling I had when I was always throwing my eyes and head around the corner of my house or doors. I personally am not one to freak out nor be scared. So I didn't think much of it. I went to sleep that night like I normally would. During the night, I felt pressure on my bed. That same pressure when someone sits on your bed, it was enough to wake me up and make me look at that general direction. I thought it was my dad sitting on my bed, which is something he is known to do, and it would often wake me up. Perhaps it was him telling me he'd come home early. But when I opened my eyes, I saw nothing. It was pitch black. And for what felt like the longest two seconds of my life, I was just staring into a dark room. I could feel the side of the bed being pressed down. And all of a sudden the pressure eased as if someone stood up. I started breathing heavily and jumped from a laying down position to my feet on top of the bed and tried to pull my light switch from my fan on. As soon as the light came on, could I notice that I was alone in the room. I was panting, feeling sick to my stomach looking around. I sprinted to the bathroom and locked myself in, putting water in my face and trying to comprehend what exactly I had just experienced. You can bet the rest of the week I was cautious around the house, since I was still feeling uneasy and skeptical. My uneasiness disappeared roughly two months after all this. And I never had such a strange experience again within my own home. My second experience was four years after the first. Me, my father and his wife decided to take a road trip. This time, we landed in Charleston, South Carolina. And my dad thought it would be cool to visit the Drayton Hall plantation built in the 1700s, as it was so nearby. We're history nerds and love to visit old historical buildings, museums and cities, and we take our tours. So this wasn't a big leap for us. It was the middle of summer and easily 98 degrees and humid outside for the entire tour. It felt like we were in an oven and the sunlight was just incinerating. As soon as the tour ended, we decided to leave. But one of the tour guides told us that down the dirt road of the property, if we look to our left as we drive, there is a modern plastic arch that if we walked through further into the property using the arch as reference and kept going straight, we would find ourselves in the old slave cemetery. She gave us a pamphlet about it and we left. 
Mind you, my family and non-believers, and my father especially, always talks about how the paranormal doesn't exist. We thought it would be cool to see an old 18th century slave cemetery. So we drove and parked our car on the edge of the dirt road, but my stepmother decided to stay in the vehicle, as it was so hot, and she had air conditioning. Me and my dad walked all the way to the location and got lost since it was taking me further into the forested area. And we expected tombstones and such on a clearing. But as we walked in, we read the pamphlet and it said the cemetery was actually a mass grave where hundreds of slaves are buried and that we should look out for the only market, which is this pair of tombstones that were put in recently of deceased people who wanted to be buried there as they trace their lineage to be that plantation. We eventually found the tombstones that we were now in, because the area looked untouched and it just had this pair of modern tombstones that looked new in the middle of the forest. Surrounded by this tree, which each one being about 12 feet apart from each other and sunlight peeking through the leaves. We walked around for 15 minutes talking and speculating where the slaves were buried and how big the area of the graves could actually be. Remember, it was hot balls outside and there was absolutely zero wind whatsoever. At one point, we found ourselves at the tombstones and decided to leave. My father started walking away as I read the tombstones for a solid minute or two. And I had this cold area in the back of my neck and the entire back of my right arm, and I could feel cold on my shoulder through my shirt. I froze in place for a few seconds, and it was extremely distinct, and there was absolutely no wind or gust, nothing. It was just as cold as ice. As soon as I looked at my dad and talked to him, he walked away. The cold disappeared, almost instantly. A few months later after this, I found out coincidentally in college about cold spots during paranormal investigations and completely blew my mind about it and made me rethink what was happening in the plantation. Ever since the second event, it's made me look more into the paranormal and I'm not sure if I'm a believer or not, but it certainly freaked me out. My boyfriend and I have lived in this house for over two years. A few weird things have happened that have made us go, hmm, but nothing scary or definitely paranormal. The most unexplainable event happened to him two nights ago. We have a back patio slash pool deck, which is a step down from a sliding glass door into the kitchen. He was outside about midnight, smoking and reading on his phone, he was sitting in a chair with his back to the house and the sliding glass door slightly behind and about two feet from the left of his left shoulder. All is quiet when he hears a loud thump on the outside of the glass door, immediately followed by a strange crinkling noise. He described it as if someone with a plastic grocery bag full of stuff in their hand walked into the door nearest us that was closed. He also said it definitely sounded like the thump came from the outside versus something bumping into it from the inside. Everyone was asleep inside anyway. It was loud enough to startle him. So he jumped up and expected to see a bird or something on the ground, which had flown into the door. He didn't see anything of the sort and started looking around the patio, trying to locate what could have hit the door. He also messed with various random things on the patio, trying to replicate the sound since it travels in weird ways sometimes. After about 10 minutes of trying to figure it out, he was at a loss. So he sits back down for another cigarette and goes back to resume whatever it was he was doing on his phone. After 10 more minutes, he suddenly feels the sensation of someone blowing on the back of his neck and every hair on his body standing up. He said it was not forceful, but not light, very precise in one place on the neck and ice cold. It being 75 degrees outside and nothing behind him but the house, he understandably noped the hell out inside. He locked the door 
and turned on the backyard lights. There was one more weird thing. The next morning he went out for a smoke and saw a folded up dollar bill which had previously been on a table on the other side of the pool, sitting on a flower planter that hangs from the security fence, separating the patio from the pool. It wasn't in the planter, it was on the edge and leaning against the fence. I know that doesn't make much sense without seeing it, but trust me, it was in a weird spot. After he told me this story, we talked about it for a while trying to come up with a reasonable explanation. He agreed that it sounded very strange. It's possible that he just couldn't see whatever hit the door and that some critter or some bird or squirrel could have moved the dollar bill from the table by the pool to the planter. He has absolutely no explanation for the breath on his neck though. He and I were sitting out there last night as he told me what he experienced and our dog would not stop staring at the backyard and growling. She spends a lot of time out there with us and has never acted this way before. The funny thing is he's not even interested in the paranormal, even though he's told me a couple of stories from his past that are very spooky. He shrugs it off as he's a very practical and logical man. He teases me when I get spooked by something and rolls his eyes when I tell him stories that I've read on subreddits. I think it's possible he has some sort of sixth sense though. He had an experience as a child that sounds terrifying, and he has experienced the majority of the odd occurrences in our home. That being said, hopefully the new backyard ghost continues hanging out with him and leaves me and the kids alone. My friend Ed was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer in April of a certain year. By July of that same year, he had been in hospital for about a month. His wife told me the night before he told her the strangest thing. He'd seen his father, uncles and other relatives that had already passed on standing around his bed smiling at him. I told my wife to pack a few bags because within the next two days we would be getting the message that Ed had passed on. Surely enough, almost two days later, Ed's wife contacted us to tell us he had. How did I know? Ed was about the fifth person I knew personally that had contracted cancer then passed from it, and each of them had mentioned a day or two before they finally passed away that they'd seen dead relatives standing around their beds or standing in their rooms smiling at them. I moved to a new apartment at the start of last month. It's only got one room besides the bathroom and the kitchen and was fully furnished. The view from the balcony is stunning. However, there's also the graveyard of this small village I moved to that's literally around the corner. And I can see this charming graveyard from my kitchen window if I stand on my toes. I went there once because it happened to be the way I was walking as I was chatting with my boyfriend. It's a very beautiful place, well taken care of, with some noble graves and a very small church in the middle. It has no locks on the gate, so people can visit whenever they feel like it. The thing that kind of bothered me was the fact that the gates make this really annoying noise, like they need to be oiled. After we got back from our walk, we never returned, but we kept speaking about it. At the time, we really didn't notice it, but my boyfriend was very nervous and seemed kind of scared. But I was also just enjoying the walk and looking around, looking at the graves, that I hardly paid attention to his mild discomfort. It was only a few days ago that he got really upset when he saw the grave of a girl who passed away this year in March, at the young age of five. Looking at him, you wouldn't really expect him to be upset by a mere grave. I spoke to him about it until we changed the subject as he got sad and he eventually went home. Fast forward to yesterday. I woke up pretty late since I was staying up late doing the laundry, sorting out clothes and looking at things I needed to get rid of. I know for a fact that I cleaned the apartment to its peak so that there was no possibility of garbage and no dirty dishes or anything. When I came back home yesterday, I discover a puddle. 
I thought my mind must have been playing tricks on me, or maybe the floor was reflecting light from a lantern outside my window, but I touched it and smelt it and it was clearly water. When I looked up to the ceiling, it looked fine and was dry, no leaks. So I brushed it off, thinking maybe I had just forgotten to clean something in my haste the other day. Hmm, that was weird, I thought. I did leave the house in a hurry after all. I was very tired, but just couldn't seem to fall asleep. I was restless and felt as if it would be wrong to go to sleep now. So I got dressed again and took a walk and stopped by the graveyard and sat on the bench in front of the gates. I remember being exhausted and my legs felt like they were pulsating. After a while, I went back home and the puddle had vanished. Everything was as it was before. As per habit, I locked my door twice at night. Last night, as I wanted to lay down to fall asleep, I heard something playing around with the door. It was 2 a.m. I was petrified and frozen under the blanket. I knew for a fact there couldn't be anyone there since my landlord lives in the apartment below and has been asleep at the time and the door to enter the house itself is always locked at night. I've heard how something or someone was trying to turn my doorknob and got more aggressive every minute. Even though it's the middle of August, I felt as if I were in a freezer because it became so cold. I could hear my door shaking and the doorknob was probably about to fall off at that point. And then it stopped, slowly, but it somehow did. Not much later, I heard crying and I listened very closely when I heard someone whisper, Mommy, please let me in. I'm scared of the dark. At this point, I almost wept myself. I grabbed my phone, which I took with me and called my boyfriend. The crying stopped the moment I dialed his number. And when he answered, I slowly crawled back into the living room before I finally started talking to him. Someone, please tell me how I'm supposed to sleep at night. When I was 12, we lived in a house in the middle of nowhere, Montana. On the outside, it looked like your typical haunted house. Canting a bit to one side, dark woods, two stories with a round attic window that occasionally reflected the light, so it looked like a face was looking out at you. There were holes in the walls and doors where the previous tenants had kicked and punched them during his many bouts of spousal abuse. The atmosphere in that house was one of lingering rage and darkness. I hated being alone in any of the rooms. It just felt dangerous, like the house itself was tainted with some unseen darkness. The weirdest thing that happened was there was one night a few months after we moved in, our dogs all started growling and barking at a little cubby space off the living room that had been turned into a computer space. They stood at the edge of the area and wouldn't go in and barked with their fur all standing up. These were smart dogs and they had only ever reacted this way to mountain lions. Until we moved out, they treated that space as if it was actively dangerous to us. Whenever my other brothers were in the living room, the dogs would always put themselves between us and that spot or growling as if to warn us whatever made its home there not to try anything. I was so glad when we moved. There were other haunted houses we lived in, but that was the one that creeped me out the most. I grew up in Eastern Kentucky and my parents were in the military. One went to Iraq to fight the war, then came back. The other got deployed within a year to Iraq slash Afghanistan. My parents were not the best because they were going through a lot of their own emotional struggles related to PTSD. Both were heavy alcoholics and they cheated on each other all the time. By this time I was 10 when my dad was gone after my mum came back and it reached its peak. She would go out to bars all night and leave me and my sociopathic brother home alone to fend for ourselves. One night she was actually home and for some reason I was terrified to go into my room so I asked if I could sleep in my mum's room while she watched TV in the living room. She said it was okay and I went and climbed into bed and started hearing this noise like a clicking noise. I looked over to where I thought it was coming from, my mum's closet. 
I felt uncomfortable, so I went out the room and tried to play it off like I wasn't tired yet. But my mum made me go back in. As soon as I got in the bed and looked over at the closet, one of her shoes was floating a foot and a half off the ground. I jumped out of bed and scrambled out the room so fast I told my mum what happened, and she said she would come lay with me until I went to sleep. I'm pretty sure she thought I was just being a kid, you know, monsters under the bed kind of deal. Then she started hearing the clicking too. She got freaked out and made my brother sleep in the room with us for everyone's safety. The clicking continued and we felt very uncomfortable and unsafe. We finally fell asleep after we all prayed continuously. In the middle of the night, my mum had to use the restroom, so she turned on the light to her ensuite. The yellow bulb blew up, sending glass everywhere, and almost immediately after, a wind rushed down the hallway and knocked all the pictures off the wall, and then there was silence. There were no doors or windows open, the air wasn't on, and it was to this day the strangest thing that's ever happened to me. I think all of the built up emotion from everyone in the house compounded and created this, perhaps. This poltergeist. The house was quieter after that, but our family struggles continued until it broke apart, for the better, and everyone could move on. This event occurred back in the beginning of October 2019. But let me give you a little backstory. A branch of my mother's side of the family moved from Illinois. They were actually all immigrants from England to the Pacific Northwest country. I currently live here. And back in the 1880s, to work in the mining and logging industries, at least three subsequent generations of the family moved here at the same time. A number of these family members were buried in a family plot in a historic, large and still active cemetery on a hill overlooking the town that I live in. There are a total of five people buried in our family plot. My great great grandfather, Elijah Bird, buried in 1911. My great great grandmother, Emily Bird, buried 1927. My great grandfather, Nigel Bird, buried 1940, son of the two mentioned above. My great grandmother, Deborah B. Bird, buried 1991. And my great great aunt Sadie, buried 1902, aged 12. Now, to my story from October 2019. I was riding in the passenger seat of my husband's truck. We were driving to my brother in law's house. We were passing by this cemetery, and I have a great interest in my family history. So I've done a good deal of research about them, and that is how I know where many of them are buried. The family plot is located about 25 feet in front of the cemetery fence, and about 30 feet from the road that passes by the front of the cemetery, the road we were driving on. The plot is marked with a large headstone, and has the surname carved in large letters facing the road. It is very easy to spot. There are some bushes along a portion of the fence line of the cemetery, but they are not present where my family plot is located. On this clear October afternoon, as we were passing my family's plot, I looked out my window, as I always do if we're going by, and was surprised to see someone sitting on my family plot facing the large gravestone. I turned my head and body to see her as we progressed down the road. And when I finally got a good look at her, I saw her for around 10 to 15 seconds. I saw that she was small and female in a white dress with some ruffles on the shoulders. To me, it looked very old fashioned, like something worn during the 1800s late. She was sitting with her knees pulled up to her chest and her forearms resting on her knees. I only saw her left arm. It was wrapped around her bent left leg. Her brown hair was long and as far as I could tell, was lying loosely down her back. I caught glimpses of what I thought were black boots on her feet. She didn't move at all while I was looking at her. I asked my husband if he saw a girl in the graveyard and he said no, but he had been concentrating on the road. I told him I saw a girl sitting on my family's plot and he just grunted and said it was weird. 
I thought a lot about it on the way to my brother-in-law's house. And while we were visiting, we took the same route home, but by this time it was dark, so I couldn't see anything in the cemetery as it wasn't lit. My mind went straight to Sadie, who died as a preteen and is buried there. She could have been around the same size as the girl I saw during her life, and could have worn something like that girl was wearing. I never have seen an image though of what Sadie actually looked like. My mother had a lot of old family photos from her side of the family, including two or three photos of passed away infants from the 1880s to 90s from my great grandma. So lots of pictures, but none of Sadie that we know of. Safe to say I was quite creeped out by what I saw. It could very well have been a living person dressed up in Victoria era clothing. That does seem far more likely, but it's odd and kind of creepy nonetheless just to be sitting on someone's grave, don't you think? I find it more disturbing that there was a living person using my family's grave as part of some dress up game, than for it to be a ghost. I'm the only one in my family that is descended from these people that lives in the entire county. Thinking about Sadie does make me a little sad. She passed so young. Child and infant mortality were very common back then and it is tragic. I have no information of what she died of. I just thought I'd share this because I've been thinking about this sighting lately and wanted to see what others think of it. I'm gonna start off by prefacing that over these last few months, I lost two family members, one being my grandpa and another being my family's seventh month kitten to FIP. After the kitten's departure, my sister decided to adopt another from the shelter. She was a sweet girl, and we'd had her for a month and a half until today. Today, I get home from school as I'm the first to arrive, and the way my room is placed is that I'm at the end of the hall, so I can see into my parents' bedroom. I had a friend over at this time, so we were just hanging out with my door open. I have another cat, it's one and a half years old and they usually just play together. So when I heard meows from the other room, I wasn't alarmed. However, when I looked, I see a light was suddenly on in my parents' bedroom. I slightly panicked, since I know I couldn't have someone over. So I immediately went to check on the source. All I saw was the lamp on my parents' headboard and my older cat sitting by the bed. I shrugged it off thinking it was just her meowing and maybe the light just wasn't turned off all the way. Although it's the type that twists on and off. I turn the light off and bring my older cat to my room. I heard nothing else from my parents' bedroom. My friend left shortly after and after a few minutes, my mum came home. She's yelling at me saying that something happened. So I rush over to her and I hear the kitten crying for help under the bed. So I grab her and she's foaming from the mouth. I've never been in a situation like this. So my first response was that she's choking. I call the vet in a frenzy and they tell me to bring her over. I later found out that she was seizing, but she passed in my arms when I was halfway to the vet. After we arrive back home, I tell my mum the story about how I thought she was home earlier and the light being on. She looks a bit confused and questioned about which light it was. I explained it was the light on her side of the headboard and she stares at me blankly. That light's been dead for months. I'm now sharing this with you all, questioning my belief in the afterlife. Never in my life have I been given a warning sign. If I would have known to check under the bed, I would have found her. But at that point, I don't think there was anything that could have been done to reverse the outcome. When I was younger, my grandma told me a story about when she was a teenager. She was walking down a road with the boy that she was dating, when all of a sudden this dog came up to them and walked beside them keeping pace. The dog was basically transparent, and my grandma and the boy pretended they couldn't see it until it vanished. I am a 36 year old woman, and while growing up in our house, we always knew it was haunted. We had an old lady 
and an old man's spirit, who we called the Shadow Man, at our home. When my stepdad would do things he shouldn't be doing, he'd wake up with these weird scratches on his back. They looked like someone had taken a pin and carved them in. When I was younger, all of us kids would watch these lights flicker on and off in our house, and our grandma's rocking chair would also start to swing entirely on its own. When I was 15 or 16, I would sleep during the day as I've always been a night person. And one time I awoke because the upper part of my right leg felt like it was on fire. When I looked at the spot that felt like it was on fire, I noticed that there was an upside down cross engraved on my leg. Fast forward. In 2004, I had my daughter. She was sleeping in her bouncy seat that I had sitting on the floor. And after she'd been sleeping for a while, I stopped the bouncy seat from bouncing. I was relaxing on the couch with my daughter sleeping. And all of a sudden her bouncy seat started going off by itself. I wasn't scared, more comforted and peaceful. I thought it was my grandma trying to comfort me. After I had my third child, me and my husband split up. He was quite abusive. We were staying in a domestic violence shelter that was also haunted. It said that there was a woman that lived there when it was a single family home. And the mother had ended the life of her child. At the time, we were the only ones staying there. One night, my kids were sleeping. And I was walking down the hall to go downstairs when I heard a child call out. Mummy, I knew it wasn't my kids since they were asleep. And I pretended not to hear it as it was just easier for me to do so. The last night that we were there, we had been watching a movie and eating popcorn. After my kids fell asleep, I went downstairs to wash the popcorn bowl. When I went back upstairs to our room, there was a pillow over my son's face. My kids were all in separate beds and the pillow over his face had come from the bed which was on the other side of the room. I rushed over to him and removed the pillow and ended up calling my husband and we returned to live with him. In the summer of 2015, I was outside smoking a cigarette and it was dark. Any time I would be outside at night, I would look up to the stars and just relax. One night I was outside and across the street above the trees, there was this huge set of lights. The lights were in the shape of an arrow. There were several different colors to it. Each arrows were of different colors, but they were connected. It didn't really make much sense to me. I pretended I didn't see it until I finished smoking my cigarette. Then I went inside to get my husband and told him about it. And he went back outside with me, only to see it had been gone. Two years down the line, I left my husband for good and moved into my own place. One morning I woke up to what felt like someone trying to suffocate me with their hands over my nose and mouth, even though I was not able to see anyone standing over me. I was fighting to try and breathe. And it took me a little bit to be able to breathe. I was yelling at whatever it was and after a little bit, whatever it was left. Only it left behind fingerprints on my face and throat. Later that day, my neighbors asked me what happened because the fingerprints on me turned to dark bruises. I work in the home healthcare field. My job title is DSP, direct support provider, and I work with mentally disabled adults. And there is something about mentally disabled people that draws spirits to them in my opinion. There were nights, the pounding on the walls and ceilings would be so loud that clients would wake up. One night I was cleaning and in between where I swept the staff bathroom to where I went to mop the floor, there appeared to what looked like blood droplets on the floor. Another night I was cleaning the commons area or living room. And all of a sudden I heard this low, deep growl sound, you know, like the type of growl a dog does before it attacks. Keep in mind, there is really thick plexiglass on the windows. So you won't be able to hear a dog growling outside. This growling came from what sounded like one of my clients bedrooms. I pretended that it was one of the clients as again, it is just easier for me to do that so that I don't walk off the job. When my boss came in that morning, I asked her if we got a dog that I didn't know about. She told me no. 
and I told her what I heard. When I came in later that night for shift, she told me that another DSP was outside smoking a cigarette, and they both heard the same thing. The other DSP ran inside the house so fast, her feet barely touched the deck. One night I was at work, and my kids were scared out of their minds. My two boys fell asleep in bed together because they were playing on the PlayStation. My older son woke up with a pillow over his face. He tried to get it off but wasn't able to get it off, and he ended up repeatedly kicking my youngest son to get him to wake up. When my youngest son woke up, even he had trouble removing the pillow. Eventually, the two of them were able to do it, and called me up crying, terrified. About a month ago, my boyfriend and I were at our house drinking. I was sitting with my back to the open window. I only had two shots of tequila at that point, and I have a big phoenix tattoo on my left shoulder. All of a sudden, the lines of the phoenix were raised. It was almost as if someone recarved the lines of the phoenix. Keep in mind, I've had this tattoo for four years, so the lines of the phoenix shouldn't have been raised like they were. It burned so bad, I was nearly crying. About three weeks ago, I was at work. The window was closed, so there wasn't any breeze going through the house in the window. I was in a commons area cleaning when I heard a crash come from the office. The flashlight had been thrown to the middle of the floor. That same week I was cleaning the kitchen at work. I was listening to the song Down by the River to Pray from the movie Oh Brother Where Art Thou. My clients were sleeping, and that song was playing and I heard the deep, dark, evil laugh. Again, I pretended it was one of my clients so that I wouldn't walk off the job. The thing is that no one else has been dealing with this other than I, and I think it might be following me. If anyone has any idea on what I can do to get this thing to stop following me around, it would be greatly appreciated. I can't use sage because I'm highly allergic. My family also has reason to believe that we're cursed, so any advice on that would also be greatly regarded. The story I'm going to tell you happened when I was little, and is basically my mother and uncle's version. When I was four years old, I was really sick. I basically couldn't digest the food I ate, so my body had no defenses, and I was sick pretty often. I never spent weeks on intensive care at the hospital. The thing is, no one knew what was wrong with me. For a year, three different doctors were trying to find out what was happening to me. They would make a lot of tests, even for rarer conditions, but they were always negative. My mother was completely desperate, and in her own words, I was gonna pass before I could even figure out what it was trying to take me. So one day, my mom was with me at my uncle's house. He and my dad's brother, and he, live with his wife, and the mum of his wife, who is also like a grandmother to me. So this old woman told my mom that she was beginning to think I was possessed by a spirit. I live in a place that has a lot of esoteric beliefs and traditions, especially followed by the older generation. She asked my mother if she remembered going to the cemetery while she was pregnant with me. At that moment, my mother remembered that she had gone to take flowers to her father's grave on All Saints Day. There's a legend here that if you go to the cemetery when you're pregnant or with a newborn baby, the spirits will try to possess them in order to live again. My mother and uncle threw me into the car to take me to a church known for such cases. My mum and uncle said I was screaming and crying the whole time in the car, and that I didn't want to go. I didn't even know where we were going, or why since they didn't tell me anything. My uncle was driving and suddenly, we ran into a traffic jam. He tried to slow down the car and then he realised the brakes weren't working. He kept stepping on the brakes without the car responding until we were about to hit the car that was standing right in front of us. All of this, and then in a matter of seconds, the car stopped completely inches from colliding. When we were already standing, the strangest thing of the trip had happened. They both felt as if several people from outside their cars were pushing the car and shaking it from one side to another. I was about to scream. Long story short, we arrived to the church. I didn't want to go in, but I finally did. I was crying the whole time, and when I got out and I was in a much better mood, 
my mum bought me donuts in our way to the car, and I ate one and then puked. But it was as if I puked something with sand and texture, something completely dry. My uncle stopped the car and got out just in case I was going to keep going. Suddenly, I did a strange sound, like a burp, but it was way too loud and deep sounding for a four-year-old kid. The next day on Monday, one of the doctors called me. One of the tests was positive. They already knew what was wrong with me. I just got a puppy. I've had him for nearly six months now, but he's a bit odd. Ever since he was a puppy, he would get very suspicious at seemingly nothing, barking at corners of the room. It would be common to see him look into a corner and growl at it, then bark and run to the door as if he'd just chased someone out. It's cute but kind of creepy, and he would always do it. Walk into a room, head would snap and look at something and would just growl the way a dog growls when he spots a cat or strange person. Two recent examples I'd like to share. I was lying in bed the other morning. Next to my bed is a back door that leads to my backyard. I could hear my dog playing outside, but I could also hear a quiet girl's voice talking to the dog. I thought no big deal, perhaps it's my mom or my sister, but I peeked out to look at him and he was just playing by himself. And then he stopped pretty abruptly and looked quite confused, and then just walked off to lay down. There have been other times where I've watched him in the yard, and he looks like he's playing with an imaginary friend. But that in itself is nothing unusual for a pup. Then last night he came into my room through the door that goes through the living room, while I was laying on my bed reading and his attention instantly snaps towards the other door. The door was shut, but he started off as a low growl, then loudly snarling and barking very viciously. I'd never seen him sound like that before. He had his hackles raised and was baring his teeth, pacing back and forth in my room, watching the door like a hawk, not taking his eyes off it. I was trying to calm him down and call him over, but he was so focused he wouldn't listen. He was making so much noise, my dad came down to see what was happening, and he tried to coax him over, but my dog was totally going mad at the door. After a minute or so of my dog going off, I got up and opened the door. He ran straight to the threshold of the door, barked a few times while looking out into the yard, then it died into a growl, and then tapered off, and he settled down. I've never seen him get like that before. I've seen him bark and growl before. I've seen him act strange with weird dogs, but when they get up and bark and growl to stare each other off, but this was more intense. What do you guys think? We built our house on an empty lot, giant oak tree, but other than that, no evidence of anything ever being here. Rather than walking through to our front door, which you have to walk through the muddy grass yard to get through when it rains, we come in through the garage. When you enter the garage, there's a small room you go through no bigger than a closet, about four by four feet called the mud room, where we hang coats and put our boots, and then you enter a second door into the kitchen. Right beside the kitchen is a door that used to be to our guest bedroom. This was for my grandparents when they would come visit, and was right by the door because my grandmother couldn't climb stairs. Today though, they have moved closer to us from five hours to five minutes down the road. We turned the room into a schoolroom at first. My younger sibling is homeschooled. There's an old fashioned school desk, a shelf, the mattress from the guest bed against the wall, a cookbook, shelf, a dresser that has been there since the guest room was still a sleeping room and a lamp by the nightstand. Anyway, a while ago on Twitter, there was something you may have heard of. It was called Dear David. It was the story of a guy who started seeing this kid ghost in his house, and it's a long, long thread that's absolutely terrifying. To this day, I can't read it, unfortunately. When I go to find the link, it looks like it may have been deleted, but I'm sure you can still find it. Anyway, the day after I read the real story thread, I was walking past the schoolroom, and I swear to you, I saw a little boy. My heart dropped. I thought I was going to puke on the spot, but I didn't. 
I fumbled for the light switch by the sink without breaking eye contact and got a look, but it was nothing. Just the nightstand and a lamp. It rubbed me the wrong way. I just couldn't get that gut feeling of dread to go away. You've heard paralyzed with fear, but you don't really understand it until you can't move, breathe or scream. But as everything, things fade with time. I never read the thread again and started working very early in the morning. So when I'd get up to leave my house, it would be quite dark. And that room, it's like the dark coming from that room is so pitch black, you can't even see through the doorway. It's been years and I still can't. Every time I look in that room, the hair on my whole body stands wrong. I can't stop looking over my shoulder when I'm in the kitchen after dark, even when my whole family is awake with me. In the daytime, I can't go out there comfortably. I just feel like there's something right behind me, always just out of view, but behind me, even to reach in there to flip the light on. I'm scared, irrationally, that a hand will come out from the dark and grab me. I've started closing that door and keep it shut 24 seven, no matter what I do, it always seems to end up open, mostly because my mother sets her bag down there after work, but some days, even after I've shut it, it's cracked open and I can't explain it. I would say I'm not paranoid of David anymore, although that particular story still terrifies me. I do absolutely believe in it and respect that entity. I don't think he ever was in my home. I think I was just afraid. But what could I have seen and why did it leave such a lasting impact on me? It's gotten to the point of fearing the dark in that room, that it's traveled onto others. When I come down the stairs in the morning, I shut the door to the workspace slash office when I use the bathroom. I check the shower for anything slash anyone before locking myself in the bathroom, even when I'm home alone. In the dark, it just seems like that room itself holds something scary and that it could travel to any of the darkest rooms in the house. Even my bedroom has lights all night that could stay on. My whole point in sharing this is to get insight on what could be going on and why that one room could form a paranoia of every dark room in the house. Why I can no longer even look at the door without feeling uncomfortable and that something's watching me. Could the story have really left me that scared without involving me? Or could I have done something, maybe had such an emotional reaction that it lured something to me? Ever since I was younger, I have always been drawn to places where the dead dwell, such as local cemeteries, columbarium and mausoleums. I've always had a strange sensation when stepping foot inside cemetery grounds particularly within indoor mausoleums. It feels like a chill coupled with an increased spiritual pressure, as if gravity is intensifying. This feeling is always spot on as soon as I would enter a cemetery or mausoleum. I would have thought that I would want to avoid places like that, especially when I'm not visiting my deceased loved ones. However, I find myself subconsciously drawn to these places. Just driving by local cemeteries slash memorial parks, I'm subconsciously drawn to enter, even if I express no intention whatsoever. I thought it would perhaps be my emotional response to entering a place of the dead. Therefore, I asked my friend to conduct an experiment where I would deprive myself of my senses, i.e. wear a blindfold as well as earmuffs. He would then drive me around to local places, grocery stores, libraries and the cemetery, and then tap me when he stopped. I would then identify if I were in a cemetery or not. Shockingly, I was able to identify whether the places were cemeteries or not based off of this feeling, or increased gravity as I call it. As a scientific individual, I am highly skeptical of the supernatural. However, I have not been able to discern why I have this particular sensation, neurological, spiritual, emotional, or otherwise. What is most baffling to me was the ability to sense spot on and more than once and accurately, whether I was in a cemetery, even by blocking my sound and sight. As far back as I can remember, I have had paranormal experiences. I like telling some of these when people are telling ghost stories, 
but I've never shared them until now. My mom was always into the paranormal and witchcraft. My dad told me there were times when she would be doing something and take off running out the house and screaming for everyone to leave. Who knows what she was doing? So I do believe my mother is the biggest reason I have experienced these things during my life. The first experience I had was when I was three. Of course, I don't remember it, but there were several family members present that day, and they have all told me the story. My cousin, my sister, mom, dad, and I were playing hide and seek. My cousin and sister, both older. It was a small house with two bedrooms, a kitchen, and a living room. No attic nor basement. There weren't many places to hide. I don't know who was doing the seeking, but I was hiding. I was told that everyone was found except me. Everyone was looking for me behind furniture, in cabinets, and in all the closets, under the beds, outside, and they couldn't find me, but they could hear me. I don't remember right off what they said, but they said they kept hearing me. They would go look to where they thought my voice was coming from, and I wouldn't be there. About an hour, more or less, I came out from behind an armchair that sat catty corner in a corner. My dad said he looked behind that chair at least ten times and I wasn't there. The first experience I do remember was when I was five. My grandfather had recently passed away. My sister and I shared a room. We had bunk beds. She was on top, and our beds faced the door. One night... We saw our grandfather in a white suit sitting in our bedroom door. We started whispering back and forth to each other about what we were seeing. He turned his head and looked back at us, put a finger up to his lips and shushed us. Then one night, we saw a hand reach into our door like it was feeling for the light switch. My sister threw something at it and it jerked away. In third grade, we lived in a three-bedroom rental property. One of the bedrooms was painted a deep blue color. I don't know why, but we didn't use this bathroom for a long time. I guess it was because we were told a teenage boy ended his life in there. Me and my sister shared the bedroom right beside this room. We always thought we would hear knocks and loud bangs coming from there. My sister got tired of sharing a room with me and basically kicked me out and I had to move into the blue room. My little cousin, who was around two, was staying with us, and he slept with me. One night, the bed started shaking, and it began banging, always in threes. My cousin woke up screaming, saying there was a monster shaking the bed. I got him up, and took him to my room and went back to sleep. I had a spirit dog when I was in sixth grade, he was a Scottish terrier that we named Scotty. I know, creative, right? He always slept with me. He got a really horrible skin infection, and I think my parents had to put him down. After he passed, I would be laying in bed, and I would hear his little nails clacking on the tile floor, and his tag clanking as he ran down the hallway to my room. And I would feel him jump on the bed and walk up and lay next to me. It made me sad. I missed that little pup. And sadly, the sensations eventually stopped. I guess he moved on. We moved a lot, so I spent my seventh and half my eighth grade year living on the side of a mountain in the middle of nowhere. Our little town was literally a one stoplight town. My mom always told me not to go into the woods behind the house because there was a cult that did dark rituals there. But she would make me go out into the pitch dark to dump scraps. She also said there was a portal in the front yard, and that we have trolls or goblins that came at night. Her friends would come over and they would play the Ouija board and stuff. That place was creepy as hell. My sister ran away from home to live with her boyfriend, and my parents would leave me at home after dark. I always felt like something was watching me. One night I was sitting on the couch watching TV. I was home alone and I heard my name being called. 
I could see down the hallway from where I was sitting, which happened to be where the voice was coming from. I turned to look and there was this huge white mist in the hallway. In the middle of my eighth grade year, we finally bought a house. I wouldn't have to move anymore or so I thought. Things picked up a lot in this house. I heard my name all the time. I kept an open Bible on my dresser and it would always be closed when I went back to the room. Things would be moved around or missing. I thought I saw an elf or something standing in the doorway at night. I would also feel cold spots and all the usual stuff. The creepiest thing to happen here though, was one day in the middle of the day, we heard this loud banging on the front door. It was me and my parents home at the time. I was in my room, mom in hers and stepdad in the living room watching TV. The banging was so loud. My mom ran out of her room screaming for no one to open the door. Cause if you open the door, you will let it in. I came out my room curious to see what was going on. My stepdad muted the TV and yelled, who is it? To receive no answer, of course. Then this thing started running back and forth on the porch and it was loud. It sounded like it was running on all fours, but it sounded like a freight train on the porch. It shook the house while it ran. It would come back to the door and beat on the door some more and then run back and forth. This went on for a few moments. My mom was scared to death. My stepdad was getting pissed, thinking it was one of my friends messing with us. He gets up and throws the door open, cussing. When the door opened, a strong wind blew through the house and the walls looked like they were breathing. My mom was like, oh my God, you let it in. They started arguing over it, so I went back to my room. As a teenager, I didn't care. I was used to all this by now. She had her friends come over to help take care of it. We eventually lost the house and moved again, this time to an older home. I liked this home, but you could really feel the energy here. The atmosphere felt thick. By this time, my parents were leaving me home alone a lot, especially in the middle of the night. I didn't experience a whole lot here except you could tell the dog was seeing stuff and the thermostat always moved. The dog didn't have much to do with me, except when it saw something. Then it would jump in my lap and shake, staring at the ceiling. I moved out, got my own place, and everyone came to my place to hang out and party. I was 16, so my friends reveled in the freedom of hanging out with me. One night, I had some friends over and we were watching the Amityville horror. It was storming out, so it was fairly creepy. One of my friends told me to come look in the bathroom. So me and the other girl go look and there's a black figure standing at the doorway. It was very large, manly looking, couldn't make out the features though. There was a bright light shining from behind him, it scared the crap out of all of us. And we all slept in the living room that night for two weeks after that at least. Random stuff would happen like a clock radio playing without being plugged in. I called my mom and she said she'd take care of it. And after that, nothing else happened. Fast forward, we moved a few more times, went through the typical seeing shadows and such, hearing children's laughter outside my window, but there were no kids around and stuff like that. I got married and moved into my husband's place. He told me stories saying his place was built on an Indian burial ground and that you could see shadows moving outside at night. I never saw anything. We moved from there to a two story place. We had twin toddlers now and he said that once some of their bouncy balls came bouncing down the stairs. He had a friend over playing video games and he confirmed the story. The balls were at the bottom of the stairs. Their room was besides the stairs, so the balls would have to come out of their room and go around the railing to get to the stairs. The twins started playing with an imaginary friend, setting an extra place at tea and such, giggling and jabbering at thin air. I would stay up late to enjoy some peace and quiet, as this was the only time I got to myself. The toys would start going off and the doors would speak. This one door would say, I love you, mommy. Even though that wasn't one of its phrases. 
One day, I was washing dishes and looking out the window. I saw a very large white orb float across the yard, come up on the porch and come through the front door. I looked towards the front door and there was a little girl standing there. But then, she went away. She followed us when we had to move in with my mum. She started becoming more visible then. One night the girls were in bed and we were all in the living room. My mum and husband said they saw a little girl in PJs holding a teddy bear come to the doorway and peek out. Another day I was sitting at the table and my mum was washing dishes. I saw what I thought was one of my girls running out of the laundry room into my mum's bedroom closet. I got up and ran after her because my mum would get annoyed if they went into her room. She heard me call after her and tell me to get out of Nana's room. She came in after me and we both went into the closet. I turned on the light and there was no one in there. We both just stood there for a moment because I swore I saw one of the girls run in there. Another evening I was giving the girls a bath and my husband was at the fire department having a meeting. I thought I saw him walk by the bathroom in our bedroom. I got up to ask him why he was home so early but there was no one there. A young guy owned that place before my parents and he ended his life in the shed. I assumed it was him. Now my girls are 19 and I haven't had anything spooky happen in several years. The girls swear they see shadows in their bedroom and hear voices in mine, but I haven't. In fact, one of the girls just came out of her room saying that her fan randomly turned off by itself. There was a strange cat locked in my basement once and there are no vents or windows down there and no one has been down there in a while. Weird things happen here, but not enough to say this place is haunted. I'm 25, and I currently went back to living in my mum's house temporarily, as I recover from a nasty relationship. About a week ago, my mum and I were talking, and she was telling me about her rough childhood. I knew my mum once messed with a Ouija board when she was younger, but I thought it was just the once. To my surprise, she told me she was a medium. She constantly spoke with the dead when she had the chance. She had my half-brothers at 16, and she messed around with the paranormal. My grandma also had my mum when she was 16, and did the same thing of speaking with the dead and practicing witchcraft, and I guess it also showed my mum. My grandma was horrible to my mother. She neglected her, abused her, and even left her starving and ate in front of her. My mum said grandma didn't know any better, and so my mum wanted to mess around with the paranormal for the attention. I think she felt very attached to speaking with the dead. Years passed by and she's currently a Jehovah's Witness and has been for 20 years. In 1994, I was born and I was born into their religious beliefs. In my opinion, my childhood was rough because of their religious beliefs pushed onto me. Little did I know I was today years old, realizing that my mom was running away from her curse. She feels protected by her religious beliefs and did not let the paranormal entities bother her. That, and I mean she had a rough childhood and tried to look for God. My youngest half-brother always tells my mum that he is always being bothered by ghosts. He tells us his stories every time he comes over to visit. I wonder, did my mum have a curse on her side of the family? But how come I never had anything happen to me? Not that I wish I can see something scary, but I noticed I've never had a paranormal experience in my life. Never seen a ghost, nor demon, nor anything that goes bump in the night. Well, maybe one bump, but I feel like it can be explained by a cat. The closest thing I had to an experience was when I was outside leaning against my car with my boyfriend at the time having a cigarette, and reminiscing the scary scenes after watching a horror movie at the theatre. We were both caught off guard when suddenly the neighbor's house across the street had its mailbox door swivel open. There was no one around and there was no wind, and yet, I feel like my boyfriend had this aura of bad luck or attracted a spirit that bothered him. Why I say that? Because he told me he also had paranormal experiences alone, but he believes it's on the land he lives on. Another time I had sleep paralysis, which I'm not sure if it relates to the paranormal, but I was on summer break, 16, 
and I'm used to my mom waking up early and go to take her to work for her housekeeping job. She would pay me cash for helping her. Waking up at seven was painful and many times I would end up not going. She usually would knock on my bedroom door loudly, yell my name and tell me to get up. All of a sudden I wake up, but I'm only half awake. I can't move, but I can see my bedroom door. I see a shadowy figure opening the door, the same shape of my mum, and she's walking around me slowly, but talking to me in her voice. The figure got close to me at my bedside, and it was like my chest was being pushed down and I couldn't breathe. Then I woke up and went down the hallway and my mum said she was downstairs the whole time and about to leave for work. I refused to let curiosity get the best out of me and try speaking to the dead. But does this mean I am not cursed or do I have a strong aura? Do I have good luck? Do I have a strong soul? I don't really know. I also have a story my mum wanted to share. My mum knows when I low key watch horror movies in our home because at night time she feels bothered or has some sort of anxiety build up, like a presence watching her. My grandma took people's photos and put curses on them. For example, she had a male friend who his girlfriend was trying to leave him. My grandma got mad and took a photo of both of them and did like this, binding spell so they stay together forever. The girl never left him, but is in an unhappy relationship and does not know why she keeps coming back. They're still together to this day. My mum was sleeping on the couch and she woke up to her dad's bedroom door, shaking and trembling, each second more loud. Then the sound of the hands slamming against the door. She yelled and the noise stopped. She checked if her dad was around and she came through the door saying he was outside the whole time. My mom's sister did witchcraft. My mother took her witchcraft book away and tried to destroy it outside. She took a match to it and tried to light it on fire, but it didn't burn. So she tossed it off a cliff and said that no one would ever find it. When out of nowhere, it came flying down at them. They ran away and never returned for the book. During the time of her being a Jehovah's Witness, she wanted to help people who were studying Bible to stop some minor paranormal activity in her home. She visited them and saw books flying like birds. She ran away and the couple moved out and sold the house. My mom said that one time in her 20s, she was sleeping alone in her home and she felt a big hand grope her and go down on her. Then she lifted the bedsheet for no one to be there. One night she was sleeping and my half brothers of five and seven had to go potty in the middle of the night. The oldest was helping his youngest brother go and the youngest said angrily, I can't go. There's a small guy with a huge hat staring and smiling next to the toilet. My oldest brother said he couldn't see anything. They both went to tell my mum next morning and it turns out she'd been playing with a Ouija board with her sister and brother and her two sons were sitting and watching. There was a moment when she felt half her face and body just go numb. She doesn't remember saying anything, but she thinks she got possessed for a split second. Her brother was next to her on the Ouija when he said in Spanish, que miras clavos? Translation, what are you looking at? Nails, staring at my mum's oldest son with a sinister smile. My mum's brother bowed his head and came back to normal. She didn't remember what happened. My mum was freaking out because her uncle who passed away was the only one who called her oldest son Clavos. That nickname was given to my brother because his hair was so thick. So when he got a haircut, his hair would stick out like a bunch of nails. Recently, I was in Charleston for a dance related event. My parents and I like to go on ghost tours when visiting places like Charleston, mainly just to hear the history of buildings and stuff. We decided to do a ghost tour of the Magnolia Cemetery. There were a lot of cool stories that I enjoyed hearing, but the one that stood out to me the most was little Annie Aiken. I don't remember much of her story, but I do remember our tour guide telling us that little Annie was a very active child and loved to play. We were told that she passed away at three of a sickness, which I can't remember. 
During the tour, I started hearing a young girl singing, but it was very faint, and I couldn't make out what the song was. I asked my mum and dad if they heard it, and they both said no. Also, at several points, I felt something wrap around my free hand. Sometimes it felt like a small hand, but other times my hand just went cold, and sometimes felt like I was being pulled into the opposite direction that we were going. Once we arrived at Little Annie's tomb, our tour guide told us her story. She then told us that sometimes, if Little Annie really likes you, she'll grab a hold of your hand. She also said that people have reported hearing a little girl singing Ring Around the Rosy, and a small child wrapping their cold hands around someone else. Once our tour guide had told us that, my dad asked if that's what one I was hearing, and I told him I felt the hand too. I was hesitant to tell our tour guide then, because we had a very freaked out and dramatic woman on the tour, and I didn't want to freak her out anymore. So I told the tour guide after it was all over. It was a very cool experience, and I've never had anything like that happen to me before. I guess little Annie must have liked me. Sometime in my junior year of high school, my dad had to go on a two-week business trip. So my friend Miranda decided that it would be cool if I could stay with her until my dad got back. I know I could look after myself, but it was an opportunity to have a two week long sleepover, so I happily took the offer. At the time, my friend's family was stationed on Fort Meade in Maryland. I stayed in her brother's room. Her brother had moved out about a year before, so at first it was really comfortable, and I enjoyed having a room in my friend's house. I felt like I was part of their family. But as the nights went on, I would say on the third night, things began to get weird. I remember I would wake up around 3am or sometimes 1am in the morning, every time I was there in that room. I found it weird because I usually woke up at 5am, so I didn't miss my 6am alarm for school. So waking up at 1 or 3am didn't make sense to me because I never woke up at those times even today. My attention, however, was always focused on one corner of the room where her brother's desk was. There was a chair behind his desk, and I always felt like something was there. I would also hear scratching in the walls, sort of like a squirrel or something was jittering around. I would just try my best to fall back asleep and ignore the scratching noises. I told Miranda's mum about the scratching noises, but she told me it was most likely just a squirrel, like I had thought but I'm pretty sure squirrels aren't up that early. Plus it happened almost every night. So even though sleeping in that room was uncomfortable, eventually I got used to it. Until the energy in that room got worse, maybe after the sixth day. I felt extreme feelings of hate and violence. It really made me feel uncomfortable, and I honestly felt like somebody was in the room with me and wanted to hurt me. It was so bad, that I would get really uncomfortable changing my clothes in that room because it literally felt like a man was watching me. Sometimes I would change in the bathroom. In my head, something was telling me that it was a male presence and it felt like it was a soldier that was middle-aged. I never saw anything, but I always felt like the energy of the presence was so strong and that's really unlike me. I always felt like he was watching me with malicious intent. I felt like I was going to be attacked continually. But anywhere else in the house, I felt normal and happy. I told Miranda about the experience because she could feel that I was afraid of that room. She told me that sometimes her dog, Bubbles, would come inside the room and just bark at nothing. Once she did it for 10 minutes, and then she just walked out like nothing had happened. So Miranda and I were discussing this inside her brother's room. And out of the blue comes her dog Bubbles and starts freaking out and barking at Miranda. Bubbles isn't a violent dog, she's small and cute, a miniature pincher, and she never acts like that, especially towards Miranda. We look at each other in surprise, and after 10 seconds of her barking, Bubble flinches and cowers towards me. 
I continued to stay in that room until I left to go back. Her little sister, Jenny, would talk about things she had experienced in that house, and one of her experiences was waking up one night and seeing someone in the corner of her room. It was tall and looked transparent, but still had color. She said it looked like an old era soldier with a blue cap and a blue uniform, and he was just staring at her. He vanished shortly after, and she froze. It really made me think that there was something in her house, a soldier that was full of hate and violence. I hated her brother's room after that, and every time I would pass it, I would feel angry and violated. They no longer live there, but the memory will stay with me forever. I am a sensitive. I have seen and experienced the paranormal since I was little. My experiences range from surprising to scary and can happen any time. I don't control it. The one thing I can count on though, is something almost always happens to me around Halloween. I'm sure most people know that Halloween is the time where the veil between the worlds is thinnest. It's not just that day. Sometimes as much as two weeks before and after Halloween, the veil is thin enough to severely affect sensitives. I have a few sensitive friends and know that some can even feel the veil thinning. Responses to the veil range depend on sensitivity and I have experienced lucid dreaming, vivid dreams and severe anxiety. I do have anxiety, which I medicate for. And last Halloween, I had a panic attack come out of nowhere. I was shaking and could hardly breathe for no reason. I barely made it back to the car. I know it was because of the veil. I don't usually have those attacks since starting my medicine. And I went back to the same mall a few months later to experience no anxiety. I don't remember everything that happens on Halloween, so the experiences I do remember are usually among the scariest. I will start with the one that happened the longest time ago. That Halloween, I had a few things happen to me as expected. I can't remember them since they didn't really stand out. This experience was more creepy than scary. It was either Halloween night or just after. I couldn't sleep, so I was playing on my phone in the dark. I decided it was time to make myself sleep. So I went to put my phone down and when I did, I saw a dark cat sized shadow jumping to my face. I jerked back thinking it was my black cat and that it had jumped from the nightstand to my bed. I never felt her land on the bed. I looked around for her just to realize she was asleep on the other side of my bed. She would have had to climb over me to lay there from that angle. It took me a while to sleep that night. This next one is my sister's experience. It happened either the same year or a little after. She isn't as sensitive as I am, so her experiences are fewer but stand out more. She was riding home with her boyfriend from the Halloween gathering they'd gone to. It was dark, of course, when he pulled into the driveway to our house. She said the lights landed on something large running on all fours. It was humanoid shaped. He didn't see it. She told me about it and I told her it was fine. She was inside and I told her not to go outside again that night. Last Halloween was my most active one. It was a week or so before my panic attack. I also had several lucid dreams and one very vivid dream that I still cannot convince myself was just a dream. I saw so much more than ghosts. I have a job that requires me to go to customers' houses to try and contact with them. I was doing what I was supposed to do when these two incidents occurred. I can't remember if they happened or not on the same night. It was just before Halloween, and I was on dimly lit back roads in my small town. In my town, most of the back roads are dark, so I was lucky to have some extra light. I rounded a curve, and my lights lit up something standing on the other side of a fence. It was a grey mass that seemed almost two-dimensional. The best way to describe it would be almost like the reports of Bigfoot. It was taller than a human, but shaped similarly. It was not Bigfoot though. It had no definition to it, and I believe it belonged to a different place. I drove faster after seeing it and took a different road back. The next thing I saw was very similar to the previous creature, except it flew. I was in my own car with the way the windshield slants, and I only saw it for a moment. 
It was almost like a pterodactyl. Ut was grey and had no definition like the other one. I describe it that way for lack of a better way. Obviously, I don't think we have extinct flying dinosaurs in my small town of Tennessee. These creatures sound absurd, I know, and even I would have had a hard time believing someone when they described them. My last experience of that Halloween was the most terrifying experience I've ever had. I was pulling into my driveway at night after getting off work. It was late, and everyone else would have gone to bed by then. It was the first time I had seen anything like it, and hopefully the last. I understand why my sister freaked out that time. A large humanoid creature on all fours was running through the yard. It was only a few seconds that I had seen it, but it was close. It was big, maybe twice the size of our chocolate lab. Once we passed each other, I didn't see it again. Needless to say, I made a mad dash into the house and wouldn't let the dogs out to use the bathroom. 